Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done yo bros we're back with the yo elliot show the elliot holes podcast and today we have a an amazing guest who's going to share his story he's going to share his breakthroughs he's going to share some ideas that could help you break through too and so uh, i want to introduce jake hart who was a fan that reached out to me because he's a filmmaker he wanted to do some work together, but he also revealed that he has struggled and overcome a problem that I noticed a lot of my students have, and perhaps even some of the guys watching this video, and that is overcoming psychiatric, psychotropic, psychiatric drugs, drugs that uh, that doctors prescribe when people find themselves maybe in depression or anxiety or something like that. And uh, there's a ton to cover here, but I want Jake to introduce himself and share his story of falling into uh, this this trap of the the psycho. How what, how would I describe these drugs that are described that are prescribed? Yeah, psychotropic. Uh, okay. Psychiatric. Those are both valid terms. Yeah. So you know you're you're sharing a method by which men can overcome. Uh, I don't want to say an addiction, but there, there's a grip that these medications come on you. Uh, or, or can have over you, how did you uh, first come to having this being prescribed for you? Yeah, so um, that's interesting. Um, so I was 18 years old. Um, and first of all, a little background, I was raised in Chatham, New Jersey. Um, very normal upbringing, right? I, I didn't have emotional abuse. There was no, um, you know, physical abuse. There was no serious hardcore depression or anxiety. There was nothing at a baseline level that said that like, Hey, this kid's messed up. You know, All I right. was, had a very normal life, was very loved by my parents and siblings. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, but when I was 18 years old in high school, I started smoking weed. Um, and over the course of about six to eight months, um, you know, it felt normal. It felt fine. I was just, you know, getting involved in, you know, drinking and smoking weed. I felt just like a normal kid. Sure. And then slowly that started to turn on me, the weed. I started I started to realize that I didn't feel like myself. I started to feel almost out of body. I, I didn't really feel connected. Um, and it actually, what, what actually what I was struggling with is called depersonalization. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but... Wow, that's amazing. A- so it started with the weed though. Uh, it's crazy because since weed has become legal in many states, I recently heard a statistic that... The instances of uh, psychiatric um, psychosis breakdowns uh, has really skyrocketed for a drug that people say is harmless. Yeah, well, they've worked on it like it's the cure for cancer, right? So it's some of the most potent stuff that we have today. And I'm sure I was smoking very potent forms of weed. I'm sure it wasn't like the weed, you know, maybe our parents were smoking in the 70s. Right. Um, And so, yeah, depersonalization, started struggling with that, had no idea what it was, went to my... um, you know, general practitioner, my family doctor, and he started me on, on psych meds at 18 years old. And what is depersonalization? 
You know, I just Personal want to back age. up for a moment because some guys, yeah. you know, they may not realize that, you know, smoking the weed is giving them this sense of depersonalization. What are some of the symptoms of that? Feeling disconnected from your body, um, not feeling in touch, feeling like uh, you're in a movie and feeling like you're on the outside watching yourself go through life. Um, very uh, numbing feeling um, and uh, can also come with deep feelings of anxiety, insecurity and just confusion. Um, but I think overall, I think if you had to sum it up in one sentence, it's in, in one statement, really, it's just feeling unreal. Hmm. So you had this sense of unreality where you're still smoking? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was still smoking. I didn't want to let go of that. I was like, man, weed has been so much fun. I don't want to let go of this. I was smoking, smoking. And then it got to a point where I realized I was like, every time I smoke, I, I, this depersonalization gets so much worse. And at that point, it actually set in chronically in my life. So whether I was smoking or not, I was chronically depersonalized. Wow. Um, so actually, the definition of depersonalization is chronic dissociation. So dissociation might come, you know, when you get into a car accident and um, you have to kind of leave your body for a minute to deal with the trauma. Right. But when that happens chronically and you're chronically set aside from yourself, that's when it, the term comes in and, and it's called depersonalization. And so you went to seek help. Went to seek help. Um, within 10 minutes, I was prescribed an antidepressant. I didn't think too much of it. I was in a very confusing place in my life. I was like, I'll do anything to get out of this dark hell hole that I'm in. And at that point, I had no idea of uh, natural healing modalities. I didn't know about diet, sleep, exercise. Generally a healthy kid, but um, none of those things were at the forefront. I w it was just, how can I get out of this? Um, and I, the doctor didn't really understand exactly what I was going through either. So he just kind of threw the pills at me. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't say for sure if they had any noticeable effect. Uh, there might have been a slight lifting of mood. Um, there might have been, uh, I think there were some changes in the way I was feeling and just some overall kind of weird side effects that I was experiencing, but nothing like monumental. Were you still, uh, were you mixing the psychotropic drugs with the marijuana? So you were still doing both? Yeah, no. So at that point I stopped smoking weed. I realized that it just wasn't a good idea to continue with that. I was still drinking heavily at that point in my life to try to cope with this confusing thing that was happening. And so for the next couple of years, I was taking antidepressants. Um, I think consistently, honestly, I might have stopped and started a few times in that in that period and just not really have known. You know, it's like people say, take your meds. And it's like, no one, nobody told me how important it is to be consistent with uh, with psychotropic medications and that stopping and starting is actually horrible for your body. So I was experiencing all sorts of things mentally, emotionally, and I didn't know what was what. And then I got to college. Um, and in college years is when really I started to take my faith more seriously. And that's when I really started to, you know, question more about God, my, my faith that I'd grown up with, you know, I'm Catholic. And I was always wondering, um, I, I never really questioned things all that much until I got to college. I actually started dating a girl who was Catholic. She was a devout Catholic, so I don't understand why she uh, was hanging out with a guy like me at that point. But um, I started, things started moving in, in the right direction. You know, I started to feel a little bit better. I was like, I have a little more stability. I have this girlfriend, you know, I'm starting to get back into my faith a little bit. I was like, I think it might be time for me to come off these meds. Um, and so I pretty abruptly I stopped um, and it, it didn't take, it was about six to nine months later. It happened over a very slow period of time that my body started to experience the withdrawal from the medication. And at about nine months after I had stopped, I was, I kind of hit like a rock bottom point and I realized I was in a really bad place. Um, but backing up a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, I guess so when I was dating uh, this girl and I was really questioning things and really getting deeper into my faith, which was all really, really good things. Um, um, at one point, you know, I decided the relationship, it just wasn't going to work out. I wasn't mature enough. I was also just struggling mentally. And I was like, this just isn't good for me right now. And at that point um, is kind of at that kind of coincided with the, the hitting rock bottom with the withdrawal. So I just broken up with my girlfriend and I'm just in this really bad place and that's when I started to turn to, to prayer more and really started to, to really beg God, just like, please, 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 like, <laughs> like show me a way out of this. This is, this is excruciating. Like this is, I've never experienced this kind of pain before. And the depersonalization came back even stronger actually. Um, 
And so I, I did feel a lot of relief in prayer and a lot of just natural, um, well, you could call it supernatural feelings of, of comfort um, and like everything was going to be okay, which was really um, amazing. But still at that point in my life, uh, when I went back home, um, you know, leaving college, going back home on summer uh, vacation, or, you know, just going back home for the summer, um, the doctors prescribed me, you know, I went to my doctor, talked to them about what I was experiencing, and then they started me back on medication. And at that point, they kind of convinced me that this was something that I'd be struggling with the rest of my life, and that the medication was going to help me um, not necessarily cure what I was going through, but the medication was going to help me manage my symptoms. And so at that point, I felt like there was no other choice, and I had to just take the medication and just be a good patient. So the medication was helping, um, but you wanted you wanted to stop. It's not clear whether or not it was actually helping, but it was clear at that point, looking back on it, that my body had grown, become physically addicted to it. Um, and that going back on the medication felt better because my body had been on for so long and the addiction part of it, like my body once I started taking it again, it was like, oh, yeah, this is this is like the chemical that we need. This is what um, this is the chemical that my body has been adapting to for so many years. It feels better when it's back in my system. Um, and, and like I said, the, at the beginning, at the outset, there was no clear indication whether or not it was helpful. It just made me feel different. Right. So it was in if I understand correctly, the the weed caused the break. And so there was a split in your psyche. And the, the, the medication that was prescribed to you maybe sort of was like a Band-Aid that uh, hid that, that sense of uh, depersonalization. And now you find yourself needing to take it. Otherwise, the symptoms of the psychotic break uh, began to show itself uh, even, even harder than before. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. And, and one important thing to note is that depersonalization in young males actually – naturally fades within about two years. The poster child of the depersonalization story is a young man who gets it in high school or college. They smoke weed. They have it for about two years, and then it naturally fades. Okay. That's a very common story, and many people I've talked to have that exact story. I believe that could have been my story if I didn't take uh, the medication, which perpetuated the depersonalization and many other symptoms. Wow. So you wanted to become free from it. Uh, the doctor yes. put you back on it. And so then what happened next? Uh, there was a series of going on and off, on and off over the course of the next five, six, seven years. I mean, I can kind of run through, you know, the, the time frame of it. But well, what made you say that, uh, that I need to be free from the, from the medication? What made you say, I don't want to take this anymore? Just a feeling that naturally I shouldn't be taking chemicals, and I felt it made me feel different. It made me feel like it, it just almost like a sense that it was just wrong that I just shouldn't I shouldn't be imposing a, a, nat, a you know a chemical force on my natural body because it's not going to end up well. That is always kind of in the back of my mind, and um, and especially as I got more into health, exercise, nutrition, and and really dove deep into these things, then I started to realize that. Um, yeah, that it really wasn't good. It wasn't Someone good who's culture. dived into this and had the experience of it, maybe you can uh, steer me if I'm right or wrong. But a lot of the, um, well, a lot of the, the crises in our society, you know, we have these school shootings and stuff. Oftentimes, they're uh, perpetuated by or, or perpetrated, sorry, by young men who have been on and off these drugs as well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, as yeah, well as suicide. Yeah, well, you know, a Adam Lanza was his name. He was uh, uh, Newtown shooting, um, the uh, Sandy Hook shooting, and he was prescribed Celexa, which is an antidepressant, um, at like nine or ten years old. Um, so I think, and I, and I don't, it's tough to say exactly if his symptoms got worse or, you know, wh where he was after that. I don't know his whole story, but he's one example. I mean, actually, all of the main school shootings, Virginia Tech and um, the other ones, they were all on psych meds. Wow. And, uh, and the suicide rate, I, from what I understand also, there are a lot of young men, obviously, that are taking their lives. But in many instances, they too have been prescribed the same types of drugs and had a similar experience to you where they're coming on and off. Were you, were you deciding to go on and off or the doctor taking you on and off? 
No, so that was actually on my own accord. Um, I think most doctors recommended that I would take it for a couple of years without any specific plan after that. Nobody ever specifically told me take this for life. Um, but it was always when I got to a place where I felt good in my life, I was like, all right, I think it's time that I stop these. And I think that that's a very common story for most people when they get to a place where they are good, then they decide that they want to come off. Um, it doesn't happen. This, this intense, nasty withdrawal doesn't happen to everybody. It seems to be somewhere between 30 and 50%. About a third of people it seems can take the medication for a short period of time, maybe a year or two, and then they can stop abruptly, come off and safely, and it their life seems to resume normally. Um, but that's not a very common story. I mean, 30% out of how many people taking the meds, I mean, there's probably somewhere around, estimated around a fifth of Americans today taking psych meds. That's about 66 million Americans. I think we also have the experience with Jordan Peterson. Uh, you know, I don't know his, to his story totally, but from what I understand, he was on a certain uh, psych meds, came off, and also had a break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was taking antidepressants way back. Um, I remember videos of him a long time ago taking antidepressants, and he was saying, like, I, like, these things are so good for me, I need these. Then he started having all those weird autoimmune issues with food. And part of that definitely could have been autoimmune, but I think it was severely exacerbated by his, and I think he admits it himself, exacerbated severely by his antidepressant um, use. And he was able to get off of his antidepressants after going on the all meat diet. But then, as we all know, he started taking a benzodiazepine. I think it was uh, clonopin. And he was taking that about 0.5 milligrams, which they make it sound like it's a small dose, but it's really not. 0.5 is a, a pretty hefty serving of that stuff. And he was taking that for, I think, a year or two. And then um, I think he was prescribed that because his wife had cancer. And then um, and then he had like a paradoxical reaction where it started to kind of attack his body, but he couldn't get off of it right away. He couldn't just stop. He had to taper off um, because even though they're chemicals and you feel like you have to jump off right away, which is what I felt many times, your body is become so addicted and so used to these chemicals that you have to actually taper off very, very slowly. And um, which make, makes it be, it turns it into a very, very difficult, tricky process. But yeah, I mean, he almost died. <laughs> he had to go to Russia for some crazy detox where they tweaked his medication and he was, he would believe he was breathing a Xeon gas, which is some, some crazy um, technique that they use in, in Russia for athletes, but he was breathe, breathing this kind of euphoric gas for a period of time, and then they were tweaking his medication, and then eventually he healed actually pretty quickly, and I think he was pretty fortunate. But that's not the story for everyone who's addicted to benzos. They The story is usually uh, takes a lot longer to heal. He healed in, I think, a period of like a year. And so what was your experience? So, gosh, okay, so... Then I was on and off over the course of the next five years or so, multiple times. It was the same pattern. I would get better. Um, I would feel better on the medication because my body was addicted to it, got to a point where I wanted to get off. I would get off, and then it would take about six months, um, which is kind of surprising. Um, and I thought that, which, is, which actually made it really hard to identify that it was the medication. Because if I stopped the medication, maybe... A week later, I started to feel horrible. I would think, okay, this is definitely related. But because of the long half-life of these medications, they can take a really long time for the withdrawal to actually kick in. And so I always thought it was just some weird health problem that I was having. So I started you know, diving into different um, health and wellness protocols and looking at my gut and looking, getting tests done, looking at my gut bacteria and all these different things. Um, and in the, I think the, about the fifth or sixth time that I stopped the medication completely, um, I literally, my bowels just stopped working. Like I wasn't able to go to the bathroom for about 40 days. Like literally, like I was super bloated. I was like pregnant and I was like, what the hell is going on right now? Like this is, this cannot, <laughs> like I must have some rare disease that nobody else is suffering from. Um, but then later I found out that other people actually ha have had that exact same experience. So, um, yeah, and then the, the, I guess after that, the most radical thing that I did, I tried a 21-day uh, a water fast where I drank 
consumed nothing but water for 21 days straight. And I, <coughs> this was actually a really horrible idea because psych meds create nutrient deficiencies, like serious nutrient mineral deficiencies. And so I didn't, and I didn't realize that that's what I was battling with. I didn't, no mainstream doctor, like any GI doctor I went to would just either try to give me pills or just tell me to eat more fiber. So I had no, I, I, no idea that I was severely <laughs> nutrient deficient. So I was like, I have to figure this out on my own. I have to just let my body do it itself. And I know fasting is good and it, there's a lot of benefits and, and, um, I'm not saying that it's bad, but for me, it was a really bad choice. And for literally three weeks, I drank nothing but water and came out of it like so much worse. And I was like 40 pounds less super skinny and just like the depersonalization, the anxiety, the depression, everything was, was just so, so much worse. I'm still uh, in shock of the fact that it all began with, you know, common, I don't say street jug anymore, but recreational, recreational use of marijuana. And so here you are many, many years later, even after quitting, dealing with uh, the symptoms of that. But then on top of it, the psych meds and how that destroyed your health and the symptoms thereof. So were you able to break free and what was that process like? So, yes, eventually I was. After that water fast, <clears throat> I had to go back on Prozac because, and I knew it wasn't, I, I was starting to, to get wind at this point that this this was a medication problem and I really had to stay away from these things. But I had to go back on because I was, literally I couldn't hold food down. I was so skinny and I was like, I just need, I need these meds to get me back to a certain level of health so then I can taper back off again. So then as I was taking very high doses of Prozac at this point and started to gain my health back, um, my physical health, then I was researching very heavily at that time and started to realize and started to uncover all of these truths and started doing really deep dives into like, what are these people experiencing? What are the studies showing about medication? Are they safe long-term? What, what do they do to your body? And at that point, I realized, I was like, all right, this is it. And I was 26 at that point, And I was like, this is, this is it. I have to taper off of this medication slowly. And I can never, no matter how bad the withdrawals get, because I had done this five or six times previously, I was like, I cannot go back on this medication. No matter how bad it gets, I just have to, I have to, to uh, you know, I don't know, white knuckle it. Like, and I didn't, at that point, I didn't even realize that there were a lot of physical things that I could do to help myself um, through that tapering and withdrawal process. But yeah, 26 years old, I finished a, a very quick uh, taper over the course of six months. What um, was your life right like now. during this time? You're 26. Are you, you know, are you, are you able to work? Were you going to school? Relationships? You know, what was going on outside? Yeah, yeah so I, I hadn't been dating for a long time um, because I just could barely handle my own life. And I was, I had been living at home. So from the ages from 23 to 26 years old, I was um, just living at home with my parents. I was working. I was always working some job, whether it was full-time or part-time, um, and functioning to a degree, but definitely not 100%. Um, and definitely, no, definitely not um, 100%. And I guess then after I, I finished that final taper, I was doing so many kind of health things and, and taking care of my body so much to the point where I felt like um, I could really break free. And so I actually, at that point in my life, I decided to travel cross country in a, a van that I had built out. And I was spending a lot of time on the West Coast and shooting films and, um, you know, discovered a really good community out there and was, was having a, a pretty good time. But then slowly, slowly the withdrawal started to creep in once again, four or five months later. Um, so then eventually I moved back home and, um, I've been at home since, um, but I've slowly been recovering over the last two years or so. And it's definitely been like a serious, seriously difficult uphill battle, but I've regained a lot of, um, you know, functioning wherewithal my body and I'm able to really kind of coming back to a sense of, uh, more normal life. So it's been two years and four months now that I've been completely medication-free. 
Wow. And what did your uh, family or friends or the people that love you uh, think about what you were going through? What kind of advice were they giving you? Yeah, so my parents, I mean, I have a really wonderful family. Um, they initially weren't too excited about me taking psych meds, but they didn't, they didn't really know any better. Um, and so every time I would have like a relapse, so to speak, I mean, that's what the doctors would tell you, that it's a relapse, even though really it's just a physical withdrawal. They'll tell you, you know, you, oh, this is your mental illness coming back and you're just going to have to take these pills for life. And so my parents were like, you know, if, if it's it's better to just take the pills and just get on with life than to struggle like this. And I just kind of believe that. I bought into that for a while. Um, so, I mean, very supportive of me. And, and once I eventually explained to them what was happening with my body and what was going on, they were much more willing to uh, support me and to you know, say, all right, let's, let's give this a try. Like, you know, let's see, let's see where you, where you can get. Would you be willing to be supportive? That's great. Yeah. God bless you for having a family and a family that loves you and cares for you that way. Uh, Would you be willing to walk us through maybe one of your lowest points uh, in this journey? Yeah. Oh gosh. The, the lowest point I could think of is, is after that 21 day water fast and how severe everything felt it was like uh like i said like just the depersonalization the anxiety the depression and everything um and suicidality i mean really never actually believing that i would take my own life but really thinking like deeply thinking that i would much rather not be alive right now i'd much rather not endure this kind of suffering um yeah i would say after then after that point that was probably the the lowest point of my entire journey thus far. And that, that was, you know, after four or five times of previously trying to come off the medication. So you realize that in order to come off it, you're going to have to face it head on. You're going to have to walk through that valley of death. Uh, it's a tough thing. You know, I deal with a lot of guys that are struggling with alcohol or uh, weed or pornography. Uh, what gave you, you mentioned prayer. Uh, what else gave you resolve and the, and the inspiration, the courage to push through when you're struggling so badly? Yeah, that's, that, that's a heavy one. Um, <clears throat> definitely faith and definitely, definitely trying to put God first and thinking like, what would, what would God want me to do in this situation? Like he would not want me to despair. He would not want me to take my own life by any means. Um, but then also just thinking about the life that I had and the health that I could achieve and just kind of the the sense of like what the and the question like what could my life be like free from these chemicals like i ha- i haven't known myself in almost you know 8 years at that point i hadn't known what my life was like free from toxic pharmaceuticals and just this sense of like my life could be so much better if i can just get through this if i can get and, and you're right like you have to go through it there's no way around it um, there's and th- and that's what I was trying to do for so long was I was trying to find these shortcuts around like the wa- like the intense water fasting or the different cleanses and diets that I was doing, um, which all can definitely help and there's definitely a time and place for that. But those shortcuts are they're they're they're, they're not shortcuts. They're they're lifestyle changes that you have to make to equip yourself to go through it because there's no way else than through it. Um, and then leaning on family, friends, and um, just basically overall the sense of like I want my life back and I I really I can't wait to see how my life unfolds when my health starts to return what were some of the lifestyle changes or paradigm shifts that you adopted to uh, help you through yeah so um diet is super key um I mean I think first it started with mindset um and that's that's really how it all starts. It starts in the mind because you have to believe that this thing is actually possible. And I think for me, it was, it was really big to see other people who had walked this journey before other people who had been in withdrawal for very long periods of time, um, who eventually came out the other side was, you know, amazing to, to see and hear those stories. Um, because you know, this, these medications have been prescribed since, you know, sixties, seventies, So this is not, I'm not a new story here. This isn't like a, you know, the only 
only person in the world who's going through this journey. So seeing other people that have made it to, to, to the other side and then employing everything in my resources I could in my, within, you know, my control with lifestyle changes. And that really started with diet. And I found that a, a diet that was very high in red meat actually was for, cause for a while I was doing a lot of cleansing. I was doing a lot of more plant-based and vegan diets. Um, and then I started to realize that um, high amounts of, of red meat and also high amounts of fruits and uh, even vegetables, nuts and seeds, just basically very basic, simple, unprocessed foods. It sounds like a lot of nutrient-dense foods. Were these uh, aiding in the nutrient deficiency? Do you think that's why it helped? Or there's something else in red meat that, uh, that speaks specifically to uh, your situation? I think meat is the number one most dense, nutritious food that can definitely help, uh, at least for me, uh, you know, all of the depleted minerals and nutrients that I had, it was extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and also fruits and vegetables, and nuts and seeds, but particularly fruits are also very dense in a lot of really good minerals and nutrients that we need um, to replete. But yeah, I think meats and, um, you know, a lot of the animal products like grass fed butter and um, eggs and all of those things were really, really can be really, really satiating and filling, but for a good reason. And they, um, they also really help with, I mean, so many other things, even just like sleep and just uh, having a, a feeling a sense of groundedness and overall well, well, well being and, and health. I like to say, I like to quote uh, Robert Blind Iron John when he says that every wound is a womb, and so everything that we battle through or every challenge that we get is a means by which we're born again. And I even remember hearing uh, Father Ripperger say something to the effect that that God allows the very demons that pester us in our lives to be there because that's the area in which He wants us to shine the most. And it seems like that's what's happening with you because now you dedicate your life to helping other men overcome this same battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's something I never thought that I would ever do and something I thought that I would never go back into this place that has been so horrifying and traumatic for me. Um, but realizing that that could be, and I think it is my mission from God, is to really to go back into it and to rehash what happened in my life and pick out all the pieces and all the things that helped and then to help other men get through the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned yeah. that by listening to other people's stories, uh, it was very inspirational, very supportive of you. I'm sure a lot of guys watching this or maybe even your friends or people that hear your story, they gain a lot of confidence just by hearing about your overcoming. Uh, what are some of the things that you do when you work with clients to help them overcome? Yeah, so first, the main thing, like I said, is is really mindset and just making sure that they have a belief in themselves um, because without the mindset, I mean, with, and without that belief in, their, in themselves, I don't think it might not even be possible. Um, the placebo effect is so incredibly strong. And so getting, the, getting them to the point where they're ready to take on these radical lifestyle changes and getting them to the point where they feel like they are ready to break free from the medical system, they're ready to break free from the labels. So a lot of like mindset work and a lot of diving into fears and sitting with fears and allowing yourself to be okay um, with the fears. Like, you know, what if my life doesn't pan out like I wanted it to? What if I'm hooked on these things forever? And just sitting with them and allowing your body to become adjusted to it and allowing yourself to actually thrive within those fears. Um, and then getting into like a lot of the, um, a lot of the lifestyle changes, like diet is, is absolutely key. Um, repleting a lot of nutrients, like oftentimes I, I always see people um, going through this journey. They're always depleted of like magnesium, um, B vitamins and targeting certain things that people become notoriously deficient in. Potassium is another big one. Um, and then working on the gut and really fixing the gut because the, the psych meds really notoriously damage all the organs of the body, but particularly your liver and your gut. And so working with them and, and you know, prescribing the right kind of diet and protocol and things that are really going to heal their gut. Um, and then 
working with their sleep, optimizing their melatonin production, um, and then you know getting into like the more healing modality side of things, like you know infrared sauna, uh, the Wim Hof method, which I'm really really big on, and giving them all the tools in the toolkit that they need to to really just be able to not only cope but thrive in their experience of withdrawal, withdrawal, and then really. The idea is that they won't actually experience the withdrawal because as they're taking the medication and going through these lifestyle mindset changes and then being ushered into a community of like-minded men, they'll be so strong to the point where when they start tapering, um, you know, their body will be will be ready for the taper. And as they go down in doses, um, you know, they'll be able to to deal with it much better than somebody who's not taking care of their of, of their body, not taking care of their mind. They try to jump off the medication right away, they feel horrible, and they're like, this is impossible. I can't do this. I need to go back on the medication. So I asked you earlier, you know, about your vocation. You mentioned, uh, was it a medical taper coach? Yeah, I mean, you, technically, I, my title could be a medication, a psych med taper coach. Mm -hmm. When would, when did you have that moment or what was that moment like when you were like, okay, I think God's calling me to serve in this way? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hmm. That's a tough one. It, I think it came, I don't know if you've watched the chosen at all. Yes. Um, but there's that scene where Jesus talks to little James and little James is saying, he's like, you know, like God, I, Jesus, I, I, I want to do what the other uh, apostles are doing, but it's so hard for me because I have this injury. And Jesus just looks at him with, with so much mercy and he just tells him like, think about, you know, think about your story. You know, I could heal you right now in the Father's will and that would be a good story. But think about how much more praise you give to the Father by still believing, even though, you know, you remain with this illness, you remain with this, with this, um, with this limp that you have. And sitting there and watching that scene made me realize, like, I'm still struggling with these things. I've gotten considerably better. Um, but I felt like little James in that moment where I've had these desires to show people what's worked for me and help them and usher them through those experiences. But I never, I haven't felt ready. Um, and, I, and I didn't feel ready for a long time. And then finally I saw that and I was like, you know what? Even though I'm still going through these things, and like I said, I've gotten considerably better, but I'm not 100% yet. I feel like um, walking with men on that journey can be almost maybe even more powerful. It's so amazing how with Christianity, as opposed to maybe other forms of philosophy or religion that promise you uh, a life of ease or, or uh, that God will take your problems away, that uh, we have so many stories of the lives of saints who the very scourge upon their life happen to be the grace by which they, they serve. Uh, you know, I think about Padre Pio, he's the first one that comes to mind with the, he was born very sickly, he was very um, ill as a child, and then suffering the stigmata and, you know, walking that life of suffering was a grace and it allowed him to, uh, allowed God to work through him. Uh, it seems like that may be the case for you as well. Yeah, I mean, what saint hasn't gone through some immense suffering that they were able to to deal with and get through? I mean, I think of also like Mother Teresa who had an immense darkness that plagued her entire life that nobody knew about when she was, when she walked the earth. I mean, hardly anybody knew that she was struggling with this darkness and absence of God, but, but she was just one of the most bright individuals and the light always shined through her. Like I mean, visibly, you know, all the st stories and testimonies from people say that she was just one of the most bright individuals ever. And it's just amazing. I liken it unto being a strength coach. You know, my job is to put resistance uh, on on people's backs, right? Let's go and squat this heavy weight. Usually things that people don't think that they can do. It's almost like God lays that resistance upon you. Or I have actually, a, one of my most popular YouTube videos on my Strength Camp channel is uh, lift that shit or die trying. And I, and I assert that, look, God is placing all these challenges in your life for you to grow stronger through. And uh, I, I bet that's a very helpful par paradigm for the guys that you work with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And even strength training is, is a, a small part of the, the course as well. And I've gotten a lot of benefit from resistance training myself, um, in addition to, you know, aerobic and anaerobic exercises and, and all of those things. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's like, 
man, it's like you don't you don't want you don't always want these things. You don't always ask for the suffering. Right. But there's something so beautiful in it that can help you just raise to the next level. And I think um, I, I guess the saint is the one who in that struggle doesn't despair and doesn't turn in on themselves, but is really able to use that and lift it up as their own kind of cross in a way um, and not complain and not not enter into the victim mentality, which I think, honestly, I think that's that's what the medical system is designed to do with the pharmaceutical. They're really designed to to make turn you into a victim, essentially, to say that, hey, like, it's, it's not your fault that you were born this way with this chemical imbalance. Like, you're just going to have to be like this for the rest of your life. And, you know, giving, I'll give, you know, they, they try to give you the courage for even, they, they try to give you credit for, you know, having the courage to even take your meds in the first place as if it was some big thing. But I think raising, be, uh, you know, above and beyond that uh, victim mentality. Um, who is it? Jocko Willink, or is it um, um, uh, the other Navy SEAL who who wrote the book Extreme uh, Responsibility? Mark Devine? Extreme, what's it called? I think Mark Devine might be his name. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was one. I think it, it was one of those guys, but it was uh, Extreme Ownership, I think it was called, where it's like you're given these certain set of circumstances where you could either kind of uh, just play the victim and just say like, man, there's nothing I can do about this. I'm just going to continue on. Or you can really take extreme responsibility and extreme ownership over it and really raise to the occasion. I'm going to totally botch this story, but while we're on the topic, um, I remember hearing a story. There's, I don't know if it's La Salette or, or the healing water somewhere in France where, what is it? Lords. Lords, that's right. Yeah. The, yeah. the 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 waters of Lords. I heard a story about a man who was uh, suffering in some way, and who was very grumpy as a result of it. Like very angry, had no faith, and uh, and it was promised to him that if he went and he received these healing waters, that he would be healed. And he goes and receives the healing, and then realizes that uh, that he's better off with the illness, uh, and so kind of asked for it back and God gave it back to him. The only difference was now he had the right attitude about it. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> right. Because, you know, I, I wish I could say I was that strong. It's crazy. I think because maybe God wants to show reliance on him, right? It's like if you healed yourself without the miracle or without the supernatural aid, there's a sense of pride, like I overcame this, I did this, I made this happen, I healed myself, as opposed to humbling oneself and uh, allowing God's grace to move us. So, well, there are obviously uh, protocol by which we can overcome. Uh, you mentioned prayer, but you also have a course, and so I'm curious. Uh, what is what is that like? Do you have a course, coaching? Do you do memberships? How is what's the uh, environment like with the men that you serve? Yeah, so basically, it is um, an online course and community um, with some one on one support from me, support in the community, and um, really, what I found is that there's a lot of um, a lot of these things that I was doing and a lot of other people were doing to better their health, to prepare for the taper and withdrawal. Um, a lot of those things um, are universal. They apply to everybody. And there's a certain set of things that everybody should be doing, I believe. Um, and then there's some, beyond that, there's a few more individual things, like a nutrient panel or a nutrient test to see like where exactly are you deficient and how can we replete those minerals and nutrients and, and how can we work with your sleep? How can we work with you know, all of the things that are the healing to, that are going to get you better? But the basic protocols is all kind of outlined in an online course. So, yeah, I guess course, community, and a little bit of one-on-one uh, -on -one work. You know, part of the email that you wrote me uh, when you proposed that we speak, uh, you mentioned that a lot of these ideas are suppressed, and it's very hard to get the word out. I mean, I don't even know if this video will be flagged or whatnot, um, but there is a means or natural means and ways by which people can overcome. But why are these ideas suppressed, and why don't more people know that they can overcome this? greed, money. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get too deep into why it might be happening and, 
in terms of like conspiracy theory or whatever, but it, it keeps us down and it keeps us weak and it lets them be powerful, more money in their hands um, and less, less cognition and less functioning on our side. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, since the introduction of Prozac in, in 1987, uh, the prescribing of antidepressants has quadrupled and mental illness and mental disability has tripled since then. Um, there's actually a really great um, investigative journalist called Robert Whitaker, and I read his book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. And he, he kind of raises the, the, the question, um, if prescribing rates have gone up, why do we have more mental illness? And it's a very simple, fundamental question. And in his book, he has 16 non-industry funded studies that actually suggest that uh, these medications are inducing mental illness. They're not solving it. They're actually perpetuating and worsening the problem. And yeah, I, I still don't understand exactly why um, they continue to prescribe. Um, some doctors are kind of waking up to this issue and they're starting to put the prescription pad down and work with people more on a holistic level. Um, but still, I mean, there's many, many doctors out there that'll see you for a 10 minute appointment, won't even really know who you are and they'll just, you know, prescribe. And it still, it still blows my mind. Wow. Are there, uh, maybe naturopaths or, um, osteopathic physicians or, you know, alternative medicine practitioners that are taking this on as well? Yes. Yes. Some very few, I would say it's for, for me and my journey, it, I couldn't tell you how many doctors I went to both, you know, standard, um, Western medical system doctors and naturopathic Chinese herbalists, all sorts of people, chiropractors. So few of the doctors I went to had any idea or awareness that this was going on and that these medications create such an incredible addiction. Um, and I think the awareness is starting to, to kind of, yeah, it's starting to become, the, people are starting to become more aware of the, the issues, but there's very, very few doctors out there, trained, certified doctors and naturopaths that are really taking deep dives into this and researching and working with people and trying to figure out like almost kind of like, what's the cure here? Like what, what's the, the cure for cancer, so to speak? Like, you know, if you, you were damaged by this medication, can we put you on another medication to get you off? Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, there's there's b very few, essentially, to answer your question. Yeah. You know, uh, the tendency is to point the finger at the doctors, right? Like, why are they doing what they're doing? But I would imagine, maybe you know better than me, that like even if they did know and they started speaking out, that they could lose their license or they could be, you know, kicked out of their associations. They could lose... Things like bad things can happen to them if they don't follow the line, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it it has happened before. Um, yeah, I know a few doctors that ha that's actually happened to, um, just because they they just wanted to help people. They they just wanted to to see what they could do naturally. They just wanted to put down the prescription pad. Um, but it's such a it's such a crazy. It's such a crazy institution, the medical system, and, and how they, <clears throat> they, they, you know, they get these students that take on so much debt, and then eventually, you know, to, for these students that feel trapped to get out of that debt, they have to adhere to what the medical system is telling them for the next ten or twenty years of their life until they pay all their student loans off. So it's very hard to jump ship from that system, and I don't blame. I'm, you know, I think a lot of them are going into it with really good intentions. Right. They want to help people. But the ones that do see the corruption, it's very difficult for them to leave and make a living elsewhere. So, uh, you know, we have these prescribed drugs uh, that obviously, uh, given your experience, are very difficult to come off of. And now we have uh, a lot of people self-medicating, right? So even alcohol, but you mentioned marijuana before. Um, I'm sure a lot of people who struggled, even with pornography, you know, they say that it has a drug-like effect on the brain, all kinds of vices, uh, not just medically prescribed. Um, generally speaking, you know, what kind of uh, encouragement or advice would you give someone who realizes that they've been hijacked by one of these substances, either prescribed or, or uh, self-medicated, that wants to get off, but they're, they're just stuck? That's a that's a tough one. I mean, that's that's heavy because for me, when it when it first happened, I thought that I was screwed. I was like, my, my life is over. Like I'm never going to be able to get off. 
Um, but I would just say to those people, like, um, it, it is possible. There is absolutely a way out, and the body is an incredible, incredible creation that can that can rewire itself and recreate itself, um, and it can even beat some of the most intense toxins that we develop as humans. Um, but I would say not to panic, not to give in to fear, because that's the surest way to just you know spiral and fall into a dark pit. But to to go slowly as well, and definitely to never stop any medications abruptly like that is cold turkeying off of your medications is one of the fastest ways to severe withdrawal and suicidal ideation All right particularly with these uh psychotropic drugs you know as we're speaking i'm thinking of a man i spoke to yesterday i speak with uh dozens of men every week about my program war on vice and helping men mainly come off of recreational drugs things that they've used to uh, mask boredom or, or things of that nature. I spoke with a guy yesterday and, you know, normally there's a sense that I can help you. Uh, this guy was smoking weed for probably, I think about 15 years, just all day, every day. And I, I didn't make an offer to him because of the amount of despair and anger that he had where, you know, he at one point says, I don't even know why we're talking because I can't, I can't come off of this. And um, and he was just shaking his head. I, I wish I could have helped him, but I just didn't feel qualified to even deal with somebody that had that sense of despair and anger. It was like at a loss. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves and you can't help somebody do the thing that you're trying to do with them if they don't believe that it's possible. Right. You know? And it was the lack of belief that wasn't there. And so you're telling you're telling them, hey, it can be done. I've done it. There are hundreds of stories of guys that you've listened to or saw that overcame it. Of course, Jordan Peterson, I guess he had the money to go to Russia to, uh, <laughs> to get gassed. <laughs> but um, I would say he had very unusual circumstances. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, but you have an all-natural uh, way through coaching, encouragement, nutrition, exercise, really natural ways, and then also a protocol by which... Now, you know, I don't want to get you in trouble... But what are the legal implications? Um, you know, I'm sure you have them sign a waiver or something like that with advising someone on the uh, tapering off of medical drugs. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I have, a, I have a disclaimer right out of the gate that just says I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not your primary care doctor. Like, you know, make sure you check with your doctor before you, you know, start any detox or health protocol. Um, and they're they're able to uh, kind of build out the taper schedule on their own accord and 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 do it at a pace that's right for them because it's all individualized some people are going to be able to taper off quicker than others some people can taper off in you know months versus some people are going to take maybe a year to do that taper and the more that one optimizes their body the 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 quicker usually they're able to to start that process and 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 follow through with it um but yeah, I mean, I, I don't take on any any of any legal responsibility for you know telling somebody exactly how much to taper at a certain time um, because it's just out of my scope. right. So um, as a personal trainer, you know, there was a time when I was doing a lot of corrective exercise and rehab and prehab and you know helping people get off of crutches, you know, things that uh, that are physically ailing them, um, and I would work sometimes with the doctor, speaking with the doctor, speaking with the physical therapist, so that, you know, maybe we're working hand in hand for the good of the client. Do you, do you uh, ever reach out or speak to, or does a client uh, also do this in conjunction with the doctor? And if so, what have their, the doctor's reactions been to this? Yeah. So it's ideal if, if somebody who uh, is, you know, is currently taking medication can find a doctor who is kind of um, experienced in this area or is at least uh, awakened to the reality that the medications can cause uh, you know severe issues and, and severe physical addiction <coughs> sorry I have a little bit of a cough um, and and like I said those doctors are few and far between so uh, what hap a lot of the times what will happen is um, if somebody says you know I want to come off my medication the doctor will say all right let's you know you're on 50 milligrams of Zoloft, let's take you down, you know, 25 milligrams next week, and then next week, 10 milligrams, and then, you know, by the third week, you should be off of it completely. Um, 
what somebody can do is go to their doctor and just continue to be prescribed their current dose and just taper it themselves. And there's different ways that you can create liquid tapers and different things that you can do to decrease the medication without ever even having to tell your doctor what you're necessarily doing. Now, I'm not advising that, but I'm just saying if somebody doesn't have access to a, a good doctor who can understand and work with you and prescribe the right amount of, of uh, tapering, um, because if you try to, if you go to a doctor and say, hey, I want to do a 10% hyperbolic taper, meaning that I want to do 10% off of this medication per month, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. They're going to say, like, that's too slow. Like, why would you, you're wasting your time. Like, if you want to get off, just get off. Yeah. Um, so coming off the medication with the help of a doctor, uh, it, you face the challenge of finding a doctor like that. I think one of the things people forget is that, you know, even though they're wearing a, a, a lab coat and carrying a clipboard, that they work for us. And so do you encourage them to look, shop around and speak to different doctors, get second opinions? And, you know, basically you're, when you go to a doctor, I don't think people think of it this way, but you're hiring them. Even though the insurance company may be paying for it, you're hiring this doctor to take care of your health. Is that one of the things that you encourage them to do? Oh, yeah. I mean, 100%. And, and I'm, I'm working on compiling a list of different doctors that nice you know understand this and, and can work in con conjunction but it's also you know by state usually you can only see a doctor that's in your state and they can only prescribe if you're living if they're living in your particular state so it becomes kind of tricky <clears throat> but if you level with a doctor um, you'll find that sometimes the doctors you know they'll be understanding they'll be like look I might not be able to understand exactly what you're going through but if you really feel like this is the best way forward then let's do it um, it's been tough for me to find a, a psych, a, a psychiatrist that's been able to prescribe like that. Um, but I know people have, and people do talk to doctors and find doctors that are like that. So that's encouraging in itself. Very cool. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your, this is sort of a journey into entrepreneurship as well, right? Because now you're essentially, um, you're kind of building a business uh, around helping people do this. And I, and I think it's a righteous form of business. I mean, I, as a personal trainer, uh, obesity is an epidemic. It is a sickness and people are suffering. And um, and I, it, it's only right that they would pay someone out of pocket in order to help them overcome it, especially if the medical profession can't help them. Uh, what is your vision? Well, first of all, what is the, what is the name of your company? I know you have a website. Uh, let's plug your website and then uh, I'd love to hear about your vision for this uh, for this coaching business or this service that you're you're now building. Yeah, so it's really simple. It's just medicationmyth.com, um, and you'll be you know once you go on the website, you'll be prompted to see basically a video and that explains the situation uh, with psych meds. And then from there, you can book a call with me to talk more about you know whether or not somebody's really interested in taking those next steps to change their life. <coughs> Um, and I think that an online course format is, is really good because you can save a lot of that time that where you'd be working with somebody one-on-one -on -one telling them to do things. Um, if you put them all the way through your course and they change their lifestyle according to that course, and then you can approach them and work one-on-one -on -one with them, then they already have, you know, 75% of the battle covered. And then it's just like, at that point, you're just, it's just all gravy from there. You're able to just talk with them, work with them, see what, what's up, what's going on with them internally, externally, and kind of tweak things, tweak the protocol to their liking. Um, and so I formatted it in this way with an online course with, you know, community support and some coaching so that I could try to help more people and get more people through and, and try to create a larger community rather than just taking one client at a time and spending a lot of time with that one client. There'd be no way for me to, to be able to, to, you know, develop a really larger kind of community. And the more people you have in your community, the more experiences you have and the richer it becomes and the more people are able to share with one another and support each other, Yeah, which I'm sure you found with your community. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely, 100%. When <coughs> they, they say uh, the, the solution to addiction is connection. And so being connected to other people. Uh, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, I, I don't follow politics that much. But from what I understand, Robert Kennedy Jr. is now uh, going to be running for president. 
as a Democrat, and he has been speaking out against pharmaceutical companies, particularly in terms of vaccines, way even way before COVID. He's just been a, a wow. zealot for this, and now he's you know he threw his his hat in the ring and he's he's running for office for the highest office. Uh, of course, you know it's God's plan. But what are your what are your aspirations? You know, is is this a matter of you know you're just getting started? You want to help people one by one, or you know, are you in a crusade to you know change the law, change the country, maybe run for president one day? I like was, uh, I was just thinking about that today. Um, gosh, it is such an uphill battle, and it's so <clears throat> it's so intense. And just the people that I've seen go before me, trying trying to speak up and trying to raise awareness about psych meds. Um, what I love is that now alternative media media is really growing and there's much more plat there's a much larger source and platform for free speech and really speaking out against injustices of which the prescribing of psych meds especially to children I think is one of the greatest injustices that could possibly happen um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it one day at a time right now trying to get those results and work with people um, one-on-one -on -one and as things pick up i would love to eventually one day be able to speak out more and as i ideally if i can grow a bit more of a following and just get connected more with people that are already in this movement then definitely i mean anything i can do to get the message out there because you know i mean you know this with so many other political issues and especially something like abortion if you can stop at the root cause before it happens then you know <laughs> the issue doesn't doesn't happen anymore. Right. So if we can get through to those people and really push for informed consent with medication, informed consent meaning that you will know exactly all of the side effects that you could experience, including extreme suicidality and extreme withdrawal, that I don't think a lot of people are going to end up taking these medications to begin with, and our problem is going to be lessened severely. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be ideal one day. Yeah, amazing. <coughs> You're taking on the mission, brother. And um, yeah, do you, uh, r r real quick, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to mention um, Ron Paul. Do you remember Ron? Absolutely, Paul? big Ron Paul fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he he actually he spoke out pretty uh, pretty heavily against pharmaceuticals and psych meds after uh, what was his name Eddie Ray Ruth. He shot Chris Kyle, the American sniper. Mm -hmm. You remember the the death of the of the American sniper? He was just at a range with you know retired veterans, um, and one of those veterans shot him. Um, he actually was very, uh, only a year or two before he had that incident and shot the American sniper, he was uh, put on antidepressants and started experiencing, um, and, and antipsychotics and was experiencing hallucinations and just crazy, crazy things. Um, and after that happened, actually, Ron Paul spoke up pretty heavily about, um, that he was like, this was the cause of the reason why he killed him. And he was kind of exposing it. And uh, I don't think... I don't think a lot of people like that in, in terms of, yeah, people at higher levels. But that was one very interesting time where I thought a political candidate spoke out. And I really, really commend that. So this... They're taking a big risk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're just little guys with our with our YouTube channels and podcasts. These guys are taking on the big guns. Um, you know, this this whole thing started with the use, recreational use of marijuana and now you know many states are legalizing it they got medical marijuana here in Florida and it's it's marketed as something that's harmless and uh, and so since the legalization of course many 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 young people are just using marijuana as a as a substitute to maybe alcohol and things like that it's uh, it's called a soft drug um, what are your thoughts and what do you have to say about uh, particularly to those who are like oh it's no big deal smoking weed won't hurt you. Um, you experienced a psychotic break. And, and like I mentioned before, the statistics are now showing that these states are experiencing, especially in young people, uh, huge bouts uh, or, or large numbers of psychotic breaks, uh, as well as crime increasing in these states. Um, where, where do you stand now on marijuana and what advice do you have uh, maybe to people who are not sure? Right. Yeah. So Marijuana, I'm pretty much a hard no, <laughs> pretty much um, entirely 100% against it because of what happened to me personally right. and because of, like you said, the in, in instances of it inducing psychosis. I mean, it's insane. Whoever thought weed could induce psychosis and people start losing their minds because of a simple plant. Um, I'm sure in maybe situations where it's um, more 
controlled um, and used as a more controlled substance, maybe there could be some health benefits for some individuals if they're able to work with it. Um, but I guess the question there is like, can it really be controlled? Can it really be regulated? Can Do we know like how much of a dose of THC or whatever it is, whatever psychoactive chemical they're getting, how much are they going to get with this one hit? And what is that going to do to their brain? And I don't think we can know for sure. I mean, just like it's it's Russian roulette with, with psych meds, we don't know who's going to get severely addicted and who's going to be able to get off of them. Um, now, weed, I don't think is as serious as psych meds, but I think there's definitely... Um, raises a serious question of like, how do we know how it's going to impact somebody? How do we know who's going to get hooked? Can we know? Right. You know? And like you mentioned before, you know, this is like super weed that people are smoking now. You, you know, it's not a simple plant that, you know, maybe your uncle grew in his attic with some light bulbs. Right. right. This is like laboratory made, you know, and if it's not weed itself, it's dabs. Uh, they're really like concentrating it. And they're turning into it. It's basically become a hard drug as a result of all the manipulation. So you're not you're not just smoking normal stuff. They also have uh, like legal weed now. Are you familiar with like um, Delta Eight? No, I never heard of that. Oh yeah, here in Florida, you can. I, in fact, right across the street, you can go and buy uh, a, a form of legal weed only because uh, they're bypassing the laws against cannabis, but they get they derive it from hemp <laughs> as a result. Huh. And uh, again, that's this is one of these um, chemically concocted laboratory plants um, that are that could potentially cause a lot of problems with people. Gosh, it's just, it's like vaping. It's like I'm sure you've seen it. You see a lot of guys who can't get off their pen. It's like vaping is actually I think worse than just smoking a good old fashioned. 100% tobacco cigarette like it goes into your bloodstream so that much hit quicker. is so hard it's more like crack it's like crack mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like no wonder <laughs> no wonder why people can't get off of it it's almost like by design they just keep designing things to get more and more addictive until at some point you just become screwed right from, you know and uh it's easy to fly under the radar with things like uh, vape and even you know dabs and because it's not like you're going to walk into work stinking like uh, cigarettes or smell like weed. It's just you're just taking a tiny little hit from this plastic. <laughs> when it's plastic, exactly. you can pretend like yeah. you know, you're not using it. And it's normalized now. It's everyone's like, ah, I got a vape pen. Ah, no big deal. No big deal. Kind of like you know, it's it's sort of like psych meds are normalized too. It's like I need, I just need my meds to function. Like it's it's no big deal. It's no big yeah, deal. Yeah, until it is. Uh, normalizing these things is dangerous. Yeah, until it is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I would love if you would share. You, now, do you have a YouTube channel or a podcast? Or are you sharing stuff online uh, to to draw attention to your to your mission? Yeah. So right now, I just have an Instagram channel. Um, I just started the company this year. You know, I've taken the the last five to six, seven years of of research that I've done and the protocols that I've developed and everything, and, and put it into this course. Um, <clears throat> and I really only launched the course at the start of this year. And so I recently developed an Instagram page to try to get the word out there. Um, and we'll see how that goes and see how quickly that might might get shut down. I'm hoping it's not. It seems like Instagram might be a platform right now that is a, a little less monitored. Um, but something like Twitter or other platforms, will, I'll, I would get shut down probably more immediately. Right, because you can't speak out against their lords, uh, the pharmaceutical companies. No, no. No, but I, I would I would like to as things progress I would definitely like to raise more awareness you know ha have a bigger presence have a YouTube channel and, and really start getting videos out there that not only and I don't want it to just be some big negative thing where it's like these things are bad you can't take them they're they're gonna kill you no I want it to be like these things are bad but you can overcome them anybody can overcome them and like show stories and have a podcast of people who have been through perhaps some of the most insane, severe withdrawals ever that were able to come out the other side. Yeah, you're offering freedom, right? It's not so much uh, a freedom from, although it is, but then focusing on the freedom too. Like you said, you always wondered who you'd be if, if you weren't struggling with it. Yeah, who would I be without this chemical influence over my brain? And I think that's an important question for anyone to ask, whether it's vaping, weed, psych meds, crack cocaine, or heroin. It's like... Who could I be in my God-given natural body? And that just opens up a whole new horizon where it's like, if I can get free of these things, the possibilities, it, it feels limitless. 
it's really it's really a freeing thought amazing so the best place people can find out about what you're doing and get involved is your website medical uh, what is it again medicationmyth.com that's a pretty cool and url my instagram is just medication myth that was that available or did you have to buy that one that was available well, medication no, nobody, myth. No, yeah nobody yeah i got, saw that one i was like i'm gonna snag that yeah that was made for you I think it was. I hope so. Awesome. <laughs> well, Jake, I really appreciate you uh, sharing your story and sharing your experience, your love for freedom with the other men and the men who are in your program. And, you know, I encourage you guys who are watching this, uh, if you're struggling with overcoming any psychotropic medication, if you're wanting to come off of it and you're, you're, uh, you're honest about your efforts, this may be a means by which you do so. Medicationmyth.com. Jake Hart, thank you, brother. Elliot, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was good. It was good getting to know you. You got it, brother. We'll talk again soon. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.